So I'd just like to take this moment to welcome you to Pacific Wild. I'll tell you a little bit about us. 20 years ago, we uh, began in the Great Bear Rainforest. The organization was co-founded by the McAllisters, Ian and Karen, and Ian is a film director and photographer. Um, so originally it was very focused on the Great Bear Rainforest, but we became involved in the fight to stop trophy hunting of grizzly bears, which was, there was trophy hunting inside the Great Bear Rainforest and the indigenous nations of the Great Bear were some of the first to say that um, trophy hunting could not happen in their territory. So that took 10 years to achieve that ban we're hopeful it will stay. And that took us into apex species, uh, the megafauna that is so popular with people and that they love so much. Um, the other thing about Pacific Wild is we're very ecosystems based in our approach. So uh, government tends to look at species on a, a species by species basis as if they're in silos and doesn't seem to draw the the A to B points between all of the species that interact in an ecosystem. And that's something that we're really passionate about. And we are also, also passionate about indigenous led stewardship. And that was very much the case in uh, the Great Bear Rainforest, particularly with the Haltzik in Bella Bella. Uh, they pretty much showed the way for a lot of nations how to control their territory and their biodiversity. And so moving into our, our wild wolf campaign, there's really three parts of it. Uh, we joined a call for a moratorium on the recreational killing of wolves. So this is trophy hunting, uh, wolf killing contests, often called wolf whacking contests. Uh, it, it's difficult getting near trapping, but we're trying to get there. And we want a moratorium until scientific and ethical concerns are addressed. So we'll talk about that later in the presentation. A big one for us since 2015 has been a campaign to end the aerial gunning program, which I'll talk about more. And the basis for everything is that we need to get more decision makers at the table where wildlife management decisions are made. So that'll be the other thing I cover in this talk. Our first speaker is uh, Cheryl Alexander. Some of you may be familiar with her. I believe she spoke at last year's uh, event. And Cheryl, um, I got to know Cheryl at the uh, Takea Festival. And of course, being that we have a wolf campaign, we instantly connected over Takea. And uh, we had a table at the first Takea Wolf uh, art festival, which was phenomenal. People came and sent art and came from all over the world to be a part of it. And it was the first year of serious COVID. So uh, there was quite a process for being able to view. We had timed in entry and um, many interesting things. And Cheryl was raising funds for Pacific Wild and another not for profit on the BC coast. Um, and what the death of Takea started was the international recognition of um, particularly coastal sea wolves, which are very different from interior gray wolves. They have a mostly marine diet. They have a different physiology. And there's actually research happening now that will provide the necessary science to have them designated an evolutionarily significant unit. So, which would be very helpful for finding additional protections for them. But I'll let Cheryl speak about all of this for you.
education tools we had on them and began to understand how significant it was that there was this rule to living by itself, that they are typically very much family animals. The islands have no deer, no small mammals, no elk, nothing that he would typically eat. He hunted primarily seal, uh, which is pretty phenomenal for a single eagle. And he also hunted and did catch sometimes uh, river otters and mink. Uh, and he feasted a bit on goose eggs. Uh, there are a lot of goose nests over there. And he also ate prickleback fish, which are these intertidal fish. But those, those were the main diets for good people see him. They say that he's probably one of the most healthy people wolves people have seen. I think of it because of all the seal oil <laughs> in his diet. And uh, he had no trouble hunting and feeding himself. At the end of January in 2020, he ended up in Victoria. And then he was trapped and caught in James Bay and then he was tranquilized. He was lucky that he was in Canada because he was a famous people. They chose not to shoot him because they didn't think that the people was in the city they were shooting. For some reason, they decided not to put him back on that. He was an old wolf. He had lived there his, most of his life. Uh, he knew how to survive there. Instead, they put him out in a place where there were other wolf packs, which would have been very dangerous for him. There were hunters, there were trappers, there were roads, there were no seal, <laughs> where they put him up in the hills, um, which he was used to hunting. So he had to figure it out, which he did. So it was very inspiring. And then the day that I heard he was shot, uh, it actually was someone who had been told, it was like a hunter, old friend of his, who was a friend of this person who was really committed to Takea, and she actually contacted me and said, a wolf's been shot that has a tag. And I knew right away it was Takea because he's the only wolf um, that conservation had. Unfortunately, the hunters were pretty alerted to where Takea was, and in fact, there were some hunters who said, oh, we're going to get me a, you know, a great trophy. When I actually, I actually did um, go to the exact place where Takea was shot, and it's in the middle of a clear cut, not a tree to be seen. In the hunter's own words, he wasn't being aggressive at all, and he wasn't a threat. In fact, you know, I'm just sort of imagining what kind of person looks in the eyes of this wolf, that so many people have looked in the eyes of this wolf and found something magical, and he looks in the eyes of this wolf and thinks, it just, yeah, it's very upsetting. Here you have Wolves are abundant, particularly on the North Island, and there is room for more hunter participation. Meaning, get out there and kill those wolves, hunters, because there's lots of wolves out there. From my perspective, no one owns a wild wolf, uh, or any wild animal for that matter. The government uh, behaves very much as if uh, they own wolves and can do what they want with them, which includes encouraging hunters to kill them. It's super important that we advocate for uh, animals to not be uh, hunted as vermin, as is actually often the case with wolves. Hunters will refer, and trappers will refer to wolves as vermin. And they somehow feel that it is their responsibility to uh, decide when to kill a wolf, how many wolves to kill. Uh, currently in BC, you do, no hunter requires a special tag or license to kill a wolf. Every other animal in BC, bears, cougars, deer, elk, hunters require to purchase a, a separate tag. They have to have a general hunting license and then they have to have tags, not for wolves. They can choose when and how many wolves to kill. In most of the province, it's unlimited. It can be as many as they want. In on Vancouver Island and another community spread the lower mainland, it's uh, limited to three wolves. 
but that is leaving it to the individual hunter to make a decision about how many wolves should be on our landscape and where and how. It, it's crazy. It's it's a it's it's taking us back to the dark ages when we were uh, fighting for our lives, I guess, against these predators, but we don't live in that kind of world anymore. So over after that event with um, Cheryl, uh, we were talking about other ways to get people involved in an engaging way in uh, wolf conservation. And we came up with this idea. Um, I had researched a bunch of platforms and found one that would work well for us for doing a trivia challenge. And uh, for the very first one, it was January 31st last year. I think we did it at uh, 7 o'clock in the evening, which meant for some people they were joining. I think we had one woman that got a special prize because she joined at midnight her time in the UK. So we had probably 50 people playing. There were 10 questions about Takea, 10 questions about Pacific Wilds Wolf Campaign, and 10 questions provided by John and Mary Thaberge, senior wolf biologists in Canada. They did a ton of studies about the Algonquin wolves in Ontario. So the, um, the first night we had, the goal was to win a prize that, it, we didn't want to be sending out lots of packages and things, that's not what it was about. And it didn't cost anything to play. But the winner would be able to talk to the Thaberges as wolf biologists and ask them whatever questions they wanted over a half an hour phone call. And uh, it turned out a young biology student from the University of Victoria won the game and actually had the call with uh, the Thaberges. So that was great. Uh, and then in future games, we have had uh, the Dutchers from uh, the uh, Idaho Wolf Research Center, where they're just having a terrible time um, with uh, wolf killing there. Uh, we had Conservation North, Michelle Connolly, and I'll be showing you some of their maps later on. They're up in around the Prince George Quinell area. And uh, we have future games in stages now. And the great thing about this platform is the ways we can use it is we can embed it in our website and create an, an engagement tool. Takea Legacy Project can have their own version of the game to embed in their website. We can have turn it into educational resources for teachers and kids can play on their phones. Uh, there is sort of a minimum age. And uh, one of the great stories that came out of this first evening was a uh, young person, I didn't know she was young at the start, but she had written and said she was going to be playing from Southern Florida. I think it was Sanford. And uh, so that's three hours ahead for one thing. And she was so well spoken and she wanted to do a fundraiser. So she set up a goal to raise, I think it was $300 US. And we set her up with a page and she started writing updates and pretty soon we had to keep lifting the amount she was raising because she kept blowing past it and her challenge was she was going to run four miles every four hours for 48 hours which was amazing and the first time she and when she played the game she was playing from the sidelines of a she was playing the game from the sidelines of a soccer game I thought she was a soccer mom, was basically where the thinking was. And then it turns out, uh, when she sent in her video for her run, she is 11 years old. And she raised $2,000 and brought so many new players to the game. She's very passionate. She did a project for school. So we're really excited. It's, it's slow building things like this. Uh, maybe some of you will register with us for future games. It's always fun. Uh, the games uh, platform is very interesting. You, you have your phone and on your phone, you 
play the game and you choose your answers, but on the screen, on your uh, computer, you get to see the leaderboard and who, who's making the points and there's a little bit of razzing going on. So it makes learning really fun. And that's been a great thing that's come about from my relationship with, with Cheryl, who is just awesome to work with at every level. Um, okay, so, This was, on this day, it was October 4th uh, this year, and we had a, a joint event at the, we called it Wolves on the Ledge at the BC Legislature. So Pacific Wild was there with our petition, Takeda's Legacy Project was there with their petition, and the Wolf Protectors of Soup were delivering hand-signed registered postcards. So these were cards that they had people sign and they took them back and saved them to deliver all at once. At this event, we're also, you, know, you can't control what happens at the ledge. You're supposed to register your event and not be competing in on same times, but it turned out right before us was uh, another organization talking about fracking, which I'll talk more about. Uh, and I know that's a problem in the States as well. And behind us with an unregistered event, I don't know if many of you have heard of it, but the Ferry Creek blockade in the forests on the west coast of Vancouver Island, which is Canada's longest uh, protest in our history and it has had over a thousand people arrested. Uh, so they were also there protesting about old growth and all of these things are tied together in the future for wolves. I'll just talk a little bit about how we delivered our petition. So you can see that round at the top. I didn't want to hand over a thumb, thumb drive. I definitely didn't want to print 500,000 pieces of paper with signatures on it, which is very uh, against the whole spirit of what we're talking about. So we had an artist take this round and on one side was a wolf paw print with the feathers and the thumb drive containing all 500,000 signatures. And on the other side was the head of a caribou. So we delivered this to uh, Minister Catherine Conroy uh, Katrine Conroy, who uh, is in charge of the forests in uh, BC. So here's the numbers. Cheryl delivered 8,274 petitions uh, calling for the moratorium on recreational wolf killing. The Wolf Protectors of Souk delivered 8,000 signed postcards and they collected many of those while Marianne Campo walked around in provincial parks over the summer on the South Vancouver Island in a wolf suit she had made. Uh, then we had uh, out of another issue with wolves on Southern Vancouver Island, which I'll go into in more detail later, uh, there ended up being a municipal resolution put forward at the Union of BC uh, Municipalities in September 2021. Unfortunately, they didn't get to vote on it right at the convention, they ran out of time. But Cheryl literally delivered the, the information to every mayor and councillor for every town and city in British Columbia, which is just an, an amazing feat. So this is how Cheryl and Kelly Carson wrote the petition. Uh, this is how they delivered their petition to Katrine Conroy. So they're in the bottom of the seal pelt is their thumb drive. And that seal pelt is actually the pelt of a seal that Takea killed and ate from on the Discovery Islands. And the, um, the, the wolf underneath was made by an artist named Tanya Bubb who made a five foot version of Takea, much bigger than this, even, even physiology. And that was in the Empress Hotel for a number of months and is now moving to a different hotel in James Bay. 
And she also has uh, sculptures all over uh, Vancouver Island. So we delivered our 500,000 signatures. Now, our premier doesn't care who signs it unless they're British Columbians. So of those 62, 640, we know are British Columbians. Some also may have been, but those are the ones who self-identified. And 248,000 were Canadians and the remainder came from around the world. So here's, my friend here is um, up on the upper right. This is Alex Winterhalt. And he is from um, like mid area of Vancouver Island. And when he was eight or nine years old and the wolf call had just started, he went door to door. He worked with a MLA, we call them, a uh, member of the legislature to design a petition that would meet all the requirements to be received on uh, the legislature floor. And he canvassed neighborhoods in his area to obtain 815 signatures and had them presented in um, uh, our halls of power, I guess you'd call it. And he was talking about how frustrating it was for him being you know, an activist so early and being so passionate about it to find, you know, it was supposed to be a five year program and they added two years and now they're calling for another five years. So uh, he was very passionate about um, the travesty of that still occurring. So now we come to the second galvanizing uh, event that happened on Vancouver Island. So the chosen, if you look on the map, is a small area along the um, south coast of Vancouver Island before you turn and head up the west side. And Souk is a municipality inside the Machosan region. Uh, it's only 40 minutes by car from Victoria. And the, the first 20 minutes are the painful ones and then it's beautiful. Um, and people there, uh, considered themselves a part of and not a part from. Uh, they didn't know there were wolves in the area. They, most people assumed being so close to a major urban area that there would not be a wolf pack in, in the area. And I'll let a local farmer from uh, Machosan tell you about his experience with the Machosan wolf pack. Oh, this is, sorry, Maya Tate is talking about uh, what happened. Tate, and I'm currently serving as the mayor of the District of Sioux. Um, I was first elected to council in 2008 as a councillor, and I've been serving as mayor since the 2014 election. Many residents were unaware that we had a local population residing in our community. We know that we interface with natural wild spaces, and we want to find a way to live together in harmony and to learn from these creatures and to share the space. We lost two wolves during the trophy killing and even reached out saying that yeah, wolves need more protection because there's no food elsewhere. Legislation treats them like harmony. There's no difference between a mouse and a wolf. And so if any individual goes out and decides on their own, uh, it the whole system falls apart. The whole symmetry and the balance that we're trying to create as a community, not, well, not only for today, but for those future generations, all of that is compromised with one selfish act. We'd like to see more protection. And so uh, District of Old Bay put forward a resolution to the Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities that called for a moratorium on, uh, on recreational wolf hunting. And, and we were asking for further consultation with Indigenous communities and a scientific data-driven analysis so that we can understand what we have before we lose it. We're at a point now, if we don't do something, we're going to lose our wolf population forever. And gone is forever. There's no way of getting this back. That is the concern. I mean, as soup is discovered, uh, more folks are very interested in our corner of the world. 
We're very proud of our community. We know that we have significant potential, but we're trying to build a sustainable future. Uh, and that means includes, including all fish and fowl and species and how do we coexist with one another. And what I don't want to see is more trophy hunting coming into Sioux and taking more wild animals that we've only begun just to understand. I mean, many were surprised to learn that we even have a whole population so close to us. We have a treasure here. We have this amazing keystone predator, and we have the ability to learn. And it's important that we, we do this for the future to, to meet climate-led initiatives and others. So what she is referring to is a hunter named Jacine Jadresco, known as the Inked Huntress on Instagram, killed two members of the Machosan pack and put up pictures of herself holding the dead wolves on Instagram and said that they were from Souk and that she had taken it upon herself to um, eradicate the wolves. She believed that killing the entire pack was what was necessary, and that's the goal whenever you're hunting wolves, and it just blew up. So uh, she is known as um, somebody who uh, tracks a lot of um, pushback around her hunting ideals. She has hunted around the world. There's a Netflix special about her where she talks about killing 29 different species. And uh, we know from Cheryl that some people contacted her to say, and they were hunters, to say, this is really bad. We're subsistence hunters, we hunt for food, we don't believe in tro trophy hunting, and this kind of social posting and activity around killing wolves that aren't causing any harm does harms all hunting and turns the public against hunters who are ethical and aren't killing for sport. So afterwards, uh, Jacine's uh, Instagram went private and the hunters we knew who weren't happy with what was happening, happening were pretty much silenced and the um, hunting association immediately, it's called the BC Wildlife Federation, which shouldn't even be legal for them to call themselves that. Uh, it's purely a hunting organization. They put a full court press on the provincial government and had their members all write and phone their MLAs and say, you know, these activists are coming after our hunting and fishing. Pretty soon we're not gonna be able to do even catch and release with a trout. So they, they really pulled out the stops but it galvanized everyone. And one of the things, uh, this is where Tom Henry talks about, despite living right next door to the Nechosen pack, he never experienced difficulty with wolves. He doesn't say in these clips, but he had told uh, our filmmaker that uh, he had had trouble with predation from domestic dogs, but not from wolves. Birds Park, we have hogs, sheep, we do big birds, we do grain crops, and we produce eggs. Uh, we supply our meat to butcher shops in the South Island, and we sell to some restaurants in Vancouver and other places. My encounters with wolves are two or maybe threefold. Uh, physically seen them twice. The more ongoing encounters I have with wolves are audio. There's a, a long standing pack up in the steep hills, and you can hear them climbing climb that if you want to. It's a great privilege to farm in this wilderness, and we have learned to exist with cougars and bears and their predation on our livestock. We lose some livestock pretty much every year. 
I've never had any negative contact with wolves. They've never predated our livestock or caused any trouble. I actually put the wolves that some wolves would be okay, and we lose some livestock because that's the trade off for them. If you were going to farm in the field, just as much as the rocks and the sea and the best we can, wildlife is part of it. If the wildlife goes away, then this will not be the same. Something that we have identified in the last maybe decade is wildlife of all sorts, predators and the prey, often travel the same game trail. And the predators are hungry at certain times of year. Like right now, they're hungry. So I think those sheep are pretty darn good right now. So you put those two things together. We do not put the sheep out on the places where we know there's a high game trail activity at certain times of the year. And that seems to mitigate the losses. And uh, we're also do everything we can to keep the uh, ancient game trails open. Um, and this is where we can have sort of a, a minor disagreement with our root vegetable friends who, who, who bets out deer. Well, quite often what you're doing is affecting off an ancient game trail. Right? And you're causing an adjustment uh, in their patterns. And maybe you're driving the, 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 the predators and deer up on the highway. Maybe you're driving it into a neighboring property. They, they follow the sports for their own reasons. Often have to follow the water books. And they've done so for a couple of thousands a year. Then we dump a bunch of feet and in there. And you got to pretend you wonder why they get it back. So we think that um, trying to understand the way the wildlife thinks and moves and not bait them up, not bait them for success, uh, is mitigating the problem. I wish all farmers and ranchers had that attitude. So uh, when all of that happened, I would say there was a huge change in Facebook activity. Uh, a lot of the hunters who were really aggressive with conservationists uh, backed off because uh, they wanted to keep their image fairly clean when protecting their rights with the British Columbia government. And interestingly, while uh, two years ago, you could see wolf whacking contests advertised on Facebook as events you could just click on an I'm going button on have disappeared. They've all gone underground. So I very much doubt that they're, uh, they've stopped. They're uh, well known in some of the interior areas where those attitudes that Cheryl referred to exist. And um, but I, I, I do think the change is happening at the public level that will uh, perhaps turn us away from the way we've done things in the past. So as uh, a result of Cheryl's work, we became a signatory on the call for a moratorium on recreational and sport killing. Uh, and the key words are until scientific and ethical concerns can be addressed. And how you do this is you actually have data. So uh, the provincial government's last census on wolves was in 2014. And they said there were 8,500 wolves approximately in the province. And their confidence level, so when you do polls and you see the plus minus for the level of confidence in the results, was 37%. We wouldn't accept that on the back of a cigarette package telling us about cancer risks. We wouldn't accept it on a poll for a poli politician. And we certainly can't accept it when it comes to wildlife. There is significant science missing and hunters talking about anecdotal reports where they don't see your deer, therefore uh, there must be more wolves. That is not science, that is bar talk. Um, so we know there needs to be better science. And we also know we need other people at the stakeholder table besides those who have a vested interest in the outcome because they are either wanting to hunt wolves themselves or are wanting to protect their ability to hunt other species that wolves uh, predate upon. So 
So that brings us to our main campaign. We've had this one going since 2015, which is uh, beyond sad that we're, we're still in the trenches on this one. Uh, so this is the aerial cull in British Columbia. We have much worsening conditions here. You're probably aware, given the fact that California had horrific wildfire, wildfires and Oregon, British Columbia had the same. So massive amounts of habitat were lost this past summer. And we have had the pine beetle infestation, which has been caused by climate change and warming temperatures. And uh, we also have uh, a lot of industry happening in our province, which I will show you as, as we move through here. And these photos are so amazing. They come from Jonah Kime, and I'll talk about him in a little bit. Uh, but the, it's very hard to get pictures of caribou. They're quite elusive, and their ranges are quite large. So these were a lovely gift of Jonas to use for our uh, campaign, throughout our campaign. So this is a map of where the caribou herds are in British Columbia. Uh, the northern group is one that we're very concerned about and the southern group population, which you can see stretches quite far north in the heart range. Uh, it also goes into northern Washington and Idaho, where the caribou have been extirpated. And many of those herds along the southern area, which we call the Kootenays, are close to extirpation. Um, and uh, when you look at the next slide, you'll see the impossibility of what is at stake for caribou. So this map was created by my friends at Conservation North. It is a map of all the human impacts on the landscape in British Columbia. So if you look, the red is disturbed by industrial human activity. And much of that is in endangered caribou ranges. Now this can be logging, fracking, there's seismic lines, road building, testing sites, heli, cats, heli skiing and cat skiing, snow, snowmobiling and ATVing in the summer. And all of these create what are called features on the landscape. And you can see there's not very much uh, range for caribou to retreat into. So this is how the cull works here. They determine uh, where the herds are, it's supposed to be where they're declining, but even if they are maintaining their numbers, they still cull. Uh, they identify um, what areas they're gonna work in, and they fly over the territory and locate a wolf, tranquilize it from the air, put a radio collar on it, and then follow it by air to where the pack is on the landscape. Then they uh, have an aerial gunning program, so the snipers come out and their aim is to kill 80 to 100% of the pack in all the areas they've identified. The cost for this when we uh, got our freedom of information response uh, back a few years ago was listed as $4,800 per wolf. There have been over 1,400 wolves killed to date and the math for that, if it's still the same and costs haven't changed, is $6.7 million of taxpayer money, which is very hard to take for the majority of British Columbians. So before I tell you about our um, court case, it's interesting to point out that the Caribou Recovery Program has uh, quarterly meetings and we're on the invitation list for that. So we attend those meetings. There's no notes provided, no recording. 
that you can listen to afterwards. Uh, you just take notes and it happens really fast. Each person in the program has their, their spiel that they go through based on their part of uh, what the program entails. And they just roar right through all of that data. And then they have a question and answer period, which is, it has a very strange uh, way of being managed. They use a, a, a separate app that you can either log into anonymously or under your name. You pre-supply your questions and people have to vote them up in popularity to see if they'll be asked. And they have 15 minutes to answer however many questions are in there. And when, it, when they hit 15 minutes, that's it. They're gone. Good night. Goodbye. We'll see you in three months. So the very first time I participated, our questions never made it to the top of the list. So this time um, we had a number of interested parties who were interested in the same questions we had. And so we were able to upvote them and, and get them higher up. And this last Caribou recovery meeting was around pre the proposed predator reduction management program they were going to run this winter. So, and they want, they're looking for another five years for this cull. So this was supposed to be an experiment uh, in lieu of habitat protection immediate. And over the five years, we just were, were just bleeding off habitat like someone on their deathbed. It's just going faster and faster. And even though the federal government once they designate a species like caribou as a species at risk, because we don't have endangered species laws in Canada, some provinces have them, BC does not, and federally we do not. But once that des designation has been applied, it then becomes binding on the province where the species lives to implement a program to return the species to sustainable abundance. And the very first thing they're supposed to do is protect 65% of endangered species habitat. And we are not near that and we're losing more all the time. And they are given sometimes two to four years to develop their plans, to report back. And in the meantime, we call it in BC, talk and log, talk and develop. So while, while we're all planning and having these meetings, the forestry and in industrial resource extraction companies and winter recreation operators are just making hay. So uh, they had the meeting in late summer about the predator reduction program and said all of their, their valued stakeholders had already provided input so they were done collecting input and they decide who gets invited into that process. Pacific Wild did not get invited into the process. So then they can say we're not an interested party because we, we have never provided any information in um, their program discussions. So it's a, it's a little bit of a catch 22. If you can't get invited, you don't count. Uh, so that's what happened this summer, and they were delivering the predator reduction program as a fait accompli in this meeting and being quite dismissive of all the questions like, couldn't we do a, a spay and neuter program? Um, could we relocate some of them? Neither of those two are actually feasible, but uh, they would just say when you'd ask about habitat protection, well, you know, it's going to take years to get to that. We all have to agree to what we're going to protect. And it was clear they were dead set, uh, pun intended, on, on uh, continuing the wolf cull program. Now, I don't believe people in the caribou management program want to kill wolves. It's very different in Alberta next to us, but in BC, people do care, and these government representatives do care about wolves, but they see this as the only viable way to protect the herds until such time as habitat can return to the state where caribou will survive. 
The only problem with that is the habitat caribou need to survive is over 250 to 1,000 years old, and they will be long gone before we get trees back to even the most minimal level because the type of lichens they uh, survive on only exists on ancient forest. So I'll let um, our lawyer tell you about our legal case against the government. And it reminds me to point out that they presented the predator management program as a done deal, even though the period for public input on that program was not going to open for another two weeks and would only be open for two months and was full of leading information and questions, but we'll get to that. And we had had two days of our court case in July and the judge added another three days in October. So there hadn't even been a verdict yet on the legality of the cull and they were proceeding with business as usual. My name is Rebecca Brenner, Animal Law Lawyer, Counsel for Pacific Wild. What we're doing is we're suing the province of British Columbia over killing wolves for their wolf call program. 1,400 wolves have been killed in the last five years in British Columbia, mainly via helicopter. There are some parts of the province where the government wants to literally annihilate the entire population, and it is completely our provincial wildlife act right now the regulation conflicts with the federal law our provincial regulations allow the use of firearms from aircraft to kill wildlife but the federal laws prohibit it one of our big concerns is that there is nothing guiding the people who are issuing these permits to ensure aviation firearm safety and the way this works out is that both the situation where there is an extensive killing of wildlife coupled with a potential impact on public safety not only should the people who have the permits know what's going on the public should certainly know what's going on as well wildlife essentially belongs to the province and public safety is certainly an issue that everyone should be concerned about these regional managers are given so much discretion to make crucial decisions. If the government wants to proceed with a call, then the regulation should be specific enough to be able to guide these people who are issuing the permits so that they could look at the law instead of just having complete discretion and power to just decide on their own. You don't want someone who's not qualified at all to be making decisions that impact literally an entire species and also literally has the power right now to put a gun into someone's hands to shoot from aircraft. So habitat loss, you can see in 2018, 83 cut blocks were approved. That's how our forestry uh, parcels these out. And BC Timber Sales is the one that puts them out to tender. In 2019, 314 cut blocks were approved. So here we are, climate change, uh, deforestation, um, biodiversity loss, encroaching extinctions, and we're tripling the amount of logging that's happening, and much of it is in endangered herd areas. Uh, 909 square kilometers were logged in the past five, five and a half years. And uh, interestingly, we remember I mentioned fracking and how that other group was with us on the lawn of the legislature. So 
I don't, I don't, can't remember the total of all oil and gas wells in British Columbia, but of that total, 3,114 were permits were given inside critical caribou habitat. And 54% of those permits are by companies uh, receiving subsidies from BC taxpayers so they can get a royalty reduction, uh, there's several classes of subsidies they're eligible for, and it turns out uh, natural gas prices are falling. There is a lot of trouble around the uh, West Coast gas link out to Kitimat, the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs have not agreed. They've been blocking uh, the creation of the pipeline and it's becoming less and less feasible to frack for gas. And in Alberta, so many wells have been abandoned. It's, it's just unbelievable. So instead of having to put up a bond in order to explore for gas and frack for it, uh, they just put up their word to say, you know, we'll, we'll clean it up afterwards and, you know, you'll basically never know we were here. So, those wells, when you look at it, the overlap that happens on critical caribou habitat is, is just, it's ludicrous. And the other thing that um, I forgot to mention when we were looking at the slide of endangered caribou is there is a very rare inland temperate rainforest. It stretches from central Idaho all the way up to Prince George. It covers 40 million acres and it arcs in over a thousand kilometers. Um, and this inland temperate rainforest, I remember I was working on um, the our local community futures board, which is an organization that uh, supports small business in uh, Canada. And our local branch, we had a board and I was on the board and we talked about um, uh, a community futures up north that had done this great project with a mill that was going to take all the slash from old growth, um, which um, the, the clear cutting of our old growth and mill ends, all of those sort of things and make a useful export product of wood pellets for burning as fuel. And they said, we'll never take a live tree. We have more than enough uh, material from the ground and from clear cuts. Uh, we aim to, to fill a gap in the middle. And when they ran out of that, they began asking for and getting permits to log the inland temperate rainforest to make terrible little pellets that get shipped by bulk out to Asia. It's, it's like the lowest value you could get for something. And uh, the other thing that happened uh, is we had a very bad infestation of the pine beetle in the interior due to warming temperatures. It used to be over the winter, it got cold enough and it killed them all off. Uh, but now, uh, there's a number of winters where they don't get enough of a long, cold snap to um, keep them from coming out. And we lost um, a, a lot of our trees. You could just look as you were driving by and you just see whole patches of the forest turning brown. And the lumber company said, you know, we, we better go in and get that before it rots. And everybody thought, well, you know, you can't really argue with that. It, it seems like a... a you know, a service that the forest industry could be doing for us. But it turns out the guidelines were, it had to have more than 20% pine beetle infestation in order for the cut block to be logged. And sure enough, once they got in there, it sometimes it was 10%, sometimes it was 5%, sometimes 15, but they just took everything. And you know, log first, apologize later. So, you know, this is the story of industry in the 21st century. And we all want to believe that, you know, they, they will do the right thing. Um, e even as, you know, the gates to eternity are opening for all of us, you'd think they would, you know, see, see the, um, 
well, it's happening on the dance card and change their tune, but so far not. It's becoming a wild west. Um, the old growth, when Horgan was, uh, Premier John Horgan was originally elected, he uh, had, there was a couple of retired foresters, including an indigenous forester, who did a 14 recommendation report on how to manage old growth in the province because it was disappearing so fast. And John Horgan campaigned on implementing the 14 recommendations and on implementing an Endangered Species Act in British Columbia. Neither of those things have happened. But the pressure has become immense. Uh, I'll just digress a little bit because it's kind of important. The Ferry Creek blockade uh, that has seen a thousand uh, arrests and it's still ongoing. Uh, there, it was led by hereditary elders um, from the Pachidat um, community on the West Coast and with um, a activist group called the Rainforest Flying Squad. And they set up camps and, uh, you know, it was just like the good old days in Clayaquat. It was um, citizen resistance. It was always peaceful. They never fought. They they didn't yell. It it was always respectful. But the RCMP really uh, they got an injunction against the protesters, Teal Jones, the logging company, and the RCMP was charged with enforcing the injunction. But as the year wore on they started doing things like uh, they were prohibited from covering their badge number and they covered their badge numbers so no one could know who they were. They were prohibited from wearing the thin blue line uh, activist thing for police that arose over the past year in response to people complaining about police brutality. And they began to use more and more violent tactics to uh, remove the protesters from the land. Things like pulling down face masks and spraying pepper spray directly into people's mouths, um, wrenching people out of um, sleeping dragons, they're called, where their um, people are handcuffed or chained to an underground uh, pipe that is cemented into the ground. They put heavy equipment and jackhammers right next to people's heads. Uh, they literally took the protesters' um, goods, like their, their camping equipment, everything, and strew it everywhere and claimed the protesters were uh, making a mess and they didn't care about the environment at all. They crushed vehicles at the sides of roads. They towed vehicles and put them in Teal Jones parking lot. And Teal Jones said, now we own your car. And it had, medi you know, the cars would have medications in them and people's uh, sleeping bags. And it, you know, it just got more and more brutal. And finally, uh, the injunction was lifted because the, judge that heard the request for it said that the RCMP's actions were being taken as an extent of the Crown's injunction. So people were interpreting it as the Crown was perpetuating violence against peaceful protesters. So that has elevated the old growth discussion in British Columbia um, into the international sphere, much as Stakea did. Uh, much as Clayaquat did 20 years ago, and uh, there have been other actions in similar parts of the province uh, in endangered caribou territory in the Selkirks near Revelstoke. Um, and this has uh, forced Horgan uh, into dealing with even a very superficial level uh, old growth, which then um, ties into all of the other things, climate change, endangered species, but he is, is fighting it and backing into it against his will. And he is, uh, he's getting caught on 
uh, BC made a big deal when Horgan was first elected of um, committing to uh, the UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Peoples, the Rights of Indigenous People. So British Columbia was going to work with our Indigenous, not our Indigenous people, the Indigenous people of British Columbia, who do not have treaties. There were never, there were never treaties. Um, so these are all unceded lands in the province and uh, therefore owned by the original indigenous inhabitants, which have been recorded as being here as far back as 14,000 years, and they will say since time immemorial. And that was a huge part of his platform, that BC was gonna be one of the first provinces in the country to really um, work at reconciliation with indigenous people and move forward in a spirit of partnership. Then it became clear that UNDRIP worked for the National Democratic Party government when the First Nations involved were aligned with, with provincial goals. So many First Nations um, have a lot of poverty. They were originally uh, cleaved away from economic development in the early stages of Canada when uh, the residential school systems were around, when uh, all of their trap lines were taken over. Uh, their, the DFO decided, oh, sorry, I should say that's our Department of Fisheries and Oceans decided that they would determine who could fish and for how much. And because um, uh, Indigenous people, Indians at the time, were seen as not uh, the, having the same rights as Canadians, at, from that point forward, they were always less than and uh, never saw the benefit of all the lands they had cared for and seized for thousands of years. So, of course, nations are looking to make income for their members. So, the Apache Dat has built a mill in partnership with Teal Jones that is meant to mill old growth trees. They, they got a pittance from Teal Jones for what, what uh, the company got to log, you know, prime forested valleys, it's high production sites, uh, it's where all of the best old growth is and the most biodiversity is, and they're pretty much backed into a corner because they need to make a living like everyone else. And who are we to say they can't log when we've almost logged them into oblivion. But that's not the way UNDRIP is supposed to work because as soon as you have a First Nation who says, we will not allow old growth logging on any of our territories, the government is never there to support them, to talk about what their goals are for their stewardship territories. And that puts John Horgan in a very difficult ethical position. So you can't say you support the rights of indigenous stewards to determine what happens in their territories, but only support that in occasional instances. So this brings me to a very interesting development. There is an alternative to the cull, which, you know, we, we changed our story, not our story, but our our messaging and our information to focus this year on the caribou, because you can't talk about culling wolves without talking about saving caribou. They're one and the same. And the caribou reduction program, recovery program says uh, culling is the only viable way to protect herds in the short term. And what they consider short term is 10 to 20 years. And what they consider medium to long term is decades from now. And these caribou herds are, you know, some of them have 80 caribou in them. Some of them have 12. So, you know, we're, we're pretty close to um, not being able to save them. So I met a, I met online 
a very interesting man named Jonah Kine. He is a BC-born uh, wildlife biologist who has studied wolves and caribou for many years. His wife has family back east, so they live in Buffalo, New York. Um, he's a data scientist and statistician uh, so that he is able to blend together biology and data, which as conservationists all know is like the holy grail of what you need to conserve species in the absence of meaningful data from government. And he had published a report, I think it was in the Journal of Science and Nature, talking about functional restoration of habitat. Many of us think of habitat restoration as, you know, clear cut logging goes through, they plant a monoculture, uh, a percentage of it survives, and it, even 40 years later, it's not a workable forest and they can't even log it yet. They thought the whole goal when they started the whole logging thing and, and talked about logging tenures was, you know, we'll just take clear cut and replant and we'll be planting a forest that will be sustainably harvested time and time again and we won't need to rely on old growth any longer and it's been 60 years in some cases and that wood is not what the forestry companies make their money on. So uh, what Jonah determined with his research projects, there was one in Alberta and one in British Columbia and uh, what they do is the first year, if you look here, this is the Parker Range in British Columbia. So I'm just going to use my mouse for a little bit. This entire green border is the extent of the Parker Caribou Herd Range. All of these dots represent cameras that have been placed on the landscape by um, highly technically qualified people. They have to be placed in a very specific way to provide the data that will drive the mitigation um, that reduces conflict. So some of these, the blue ones are game trail cameras. The green ones are linear developments. So that's um, any of those human caused uh, impacts on the landscape. And uh, the other ones are the cameras that showed what happened after the, the mitigation was applied. Now, what they do for mitigation is it's a process. Um, so the first year the cameras go in and they record all of the interactions and numbers of animals that are in the ecosystem where the caribou reside. So in this case, they recorded 795 wolf. So this is 795 times uh, a wolf passed in front of a camera and they have ways uh, in the study that show what they count as a separate wolf from the wolf that just appeared seconds before. 2000 and some change caribou, 1400 plus moose and 1729 black bears. So that's the animals that were moving around the ecosystem. So what they do with the cameras is they determine where the, uh, the caribou are encountering wolves and other ungulates on the landscape. So if caribou and bear, caribou bears and wolves are all using the same features it's highly likely that other ungulates will travel in that area and the wolves will by following those ungulates will find the caribou and now the caribou don't have protection and caribou are really interesting because Jonah calls them nature's ultimate social distancer they don't like to be around other ungulates they have separate food sources uh, most of their food sources, especially in the winter months, are in high elevation, high snow areas, and their hooves are uniquely uh, able to manage that snow, and that's where the lichens are that they need in the winter months. And in the summer, they spend a lot of time in peat bogs and marshy areas where there isn't enough vegetation for other ungulates, and some of them have difficulty managing in those kinds of settings. So they find out where all of the animals are. 
then they look at the rates of travel on those features where the caribou and predators are encountering each other. And the way they do the rates of travel is they walk on the feature and time, how long it takes them to walk an X amount of uh, meters or, or uh, yards. And then another person walks in the forest for the same distance and times how long it takes them. And then what they do with that data is out of everything they can choose to do, they'll look at 40 to 45% of the features to mitigate. And those will be the ones where there is the most access, easiest access for both predators and other ungulates and they will select from those features to mitigate. And the way they mitigate is they plant trees, they mound soil, and they fall trees, hinging them over features to slow the rate of travel. Then they do another walk test when the mitigation is done and make sure the, the speed of travel is the same or slower than it is in the forest that immediately reduces the return on investment for wolves who, one, hunting in packs requires coordinated movement through big spaces, which are, is difficult in a forest. And the other part of it is that um, uh, the, sorry, I'm sorry, gapping on, on this, this last little bit, but it, it slows it to the point that the caribou are no longer in the same uh, area as the ungulates, the moose are the, the wolves are targeting. So now you've reduced the conflicts. And Jonah found that mitigating approximately 40% of the features created an 85% reduction in interactions between wolves and caribou. So, and the government's, uh, the government does have uh, partnerships doing some habitat restoration, but it's not scientifically arrived at. It, it, they don't do this camera work. So this actually takes three years. The first year is placing the 100 cameras and getting the data. Over the next six months, you're planning the mitigations that are gonna be done, doing the technical work, getting the cameras and you know, the, the contractors in place so you know what you're gonna be doing out on the landscape. And the second year, you are uh, tracking what's happening on the cameras. And the third year, you're reporting on um, the efficacy of it. So there has been two of these projects done. Uh, interestingly, uh, I have mixed feelings about this, but both were funded by the oil and gas industry in BC and Alberta. So, um, you know, the mixed feelings comes from if, if industry attempts to use these as selling points on why uh, further habitat loss should be permitted, then it's, it's a not a very good trade. Um, if, however, they acknowledge that we have to protect habitat and one of the things that can happen is industry um, contributing to mitigating habitat that has not been restored and will not be restored in a timely manner to save caribou, then that would be a good thing. I mean, I think all of us have a dream of uh, the economy and, and ecology working towards common good. So this is uh, the, it shows how it affects the travel speed. So you can see on the left that as the speed increases, the wolves interact more frequently with the caribou. And on the other side, you can see that the snow depth provides the distancing for caribou. So um, I can post, uh, provide these uh, slide notes and the reports to Sedona Wolf Week after for anybody who's really into geeking out on 
um, science papers. Uh, so these are the ways that you do mitigation values and because it had so much science in it and data collection and it was so meticulous, it actually has, um, I think, a, a quicker uh, path to being a workable, testable solution in a number of herds in BC. And, and our goal, and for many organizations and First Nations, would be that these mitigation projects would take the place of a cull, that we wouldn't need culling. Now, it doesn't always work. There has to be enough abundant prey in the other species uh, that wolves target in order to make it a workable um, uh, mitigation for wolves. But I think it has a lot of promise. And what I'm really excited about is that uh, we had um, one of our uh, newsletter subscribers wrote us and said they'd arranged a meeting with someone in the caribou recovery program and uh, she was asking all the organizations uh, what questions she might want to in include and um, we put forward would the caribou recovery program be willing to meet with jonah kine in order to talk about the differences between his functional restoration and traditional habitat restoration and to our great surprise they have said yes and that is a wonderful thing to have happen if if we can accomplish that and it results in even one project that would be a huge win so uh, what's next for uh, our campaign to save BC wolves we're waiting for the outcome of our court case. Uh, it should be fairly soon. Um, if, if we win, that's one thing. Uh, if we don't win, then we go back to the drawing board and we have, uh, I don't know if many of you heard the story of the uh, conservation officer in British Columbia who refused to kill two orphan bear cubs after their mother was shot as a danger to humans and uh, he was fired and he took the BC government to court and won and now he's fighting to get his job back. Uh, he is our policy analyst and legal advisor so he'll be continuing on that legal front uh, to look for ways that we can uh, put a pause and get some other science happening and, and see if there's other ways to save caribou without culling massive amounts of wolves. Um, the big, the biggest thing that has to change is, and I'm sure it's the same for everyone south of us uh, in the United States, we all share the same uh, North American model of wildlife management, which was actually um, created in response to overhunting, ironically enough and uh, it treats all wildlife species as harvestable units for the benefits of human beings. Uh, the animals and uh, other species don't have a right to existence uh, only for their own purpose. Um, they're all, uh, in British Columbia, the Wildlife Act states that British Columbia uh, owns the wildlife as vested in the government, which represents all British Columbians. There have been, uh, so we've talked about this, the, the stakeholder group is mainly hunter associations, guide outfitting associations, government, government biologists, and uh, aligned First Nations who agree to um, either they, there are a few, uh, probably two I think, that do allow hunting of wolves in their territories. And there are some who have agreed to allow culling to take place to preserve car caribou. And that effectively silences them for speaking out because they're now in an agreement. But the vast majority of British Columbians who also own all of the wildlife 
don't have a voice. So Cheryl Alexander, the Wolf Protectors of Souk, uh, Maya Tate, Pacific Wild, and tens of other organizations and First Nations in British Columbia do not agree. There was a poll a number of years ago about trophy hunting. 86% of British Columbians polled said they were against trophy hunting. Um, so because it is so dominated by this group of, of decision makers, it ends up with a bias in all of the communication that comes out. So for example, with the, the period to accept public feedback, the way the information was presented and the questions posed all led the public to accept that culling is the only way to save caribou. And there was recently an article by three scientists who called out the government for the misinformation. We all know the trouble we get into with misinformation. Uh, it's, not, it's not just Zuckerberg. So uh, we're all pushing to have more stakeholders at that table and more of a holistic voice determining those things and faster. To that end, this came totally unsolicited to our email inbox. The Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs wrote a letter in support of our campaigns, both on the front of the cull and the moratorium. This is wonderful, wonderful news. We didn't ask for it. I'm going to reach out to Judy Wilson, who uh, was apparently the um, instigator for this and is uh, um, in chase at, at uh, the First Nations there. So again, this is the ethical bind that the Premier is in because you have all of the, you know, an organization representing all of the British Columbia Indian chiefs saying, no, you can't do this. So these are all of the people we've collaborated over the last five years. We've talked about many of them. Uh, Humane Society is doing a lot of work on the wolf cull in uh, Canada. They're raising visibility across the country. Animal Alliance Canada has reached out to us and wants to do a billboard campaign in Horgan's riding, uh, which would be excellent. And I've been in early discussions with two First Nations in an endangered herd air, uh, area in the Caribou in the interior of British Columbia. They would like to restrict access in the backcountry um, by uh, for industrial permits and uh, logging backcountry use to protect caribou uh, in the hopes of ending the cull because even though they are in an agreement with the province for it, they are really looking for an alternate solution. So here's how you can help. Uh, we have donors and supporters from all around the world. You're all a part of our family and everything um, you give and do makes a huge difference for us. Uh, there will be, our website is specificwild.org. I'll have that up on the screen at the end. And something that um, I was really pushing for, um, I became the director of community in addition to Wolf Campaigner this past year. And we have a free, online uh, membership community you don't you don't have to pay you don't have to be on social media you don't need to use instagram or facebook or any of those things you just request to join tell us a little bit about yourself so that we can control the who joins and make sure it's it's people who are truly um, invested into um, saving wolves and finding alternatives to the killing of them and uh, I will make a small note, make sure to change your notification settings so that you only get notifications when the host or moderators post. Cheryl Alexander is a member, Marianne and Sabina from the Soup Wolf Protectors, and we have a few people from other organizations. We have biologists from all around the world, storytellers, uh, letter writers, activists, artists, and we have a section called Wolves Around the World where we often post uh, a lot of things about, you know, wolves returning to landscapes in Germany, in Italy, things like that. So 
Uh, it's a great place to connect and feel wolfy and we put some stuff up in there, shareable graphics and video clips and um, you know, you hear about things first. So I'd love to see as many people as possible join that. Uh, so this goes without speaking, all the great people who participated. Uh, what we're planning on doing with these video clips, we actually have quite a lot of footage from Jonah that we shot in Buffalo. And uh, the goal was to have a full 24 minute video for this event, but it, it turned out it was a little ambitious in the time we had. So we will be filling in all of Jonah's footage, getting an indigenous perspective and having the federal government and wildlife service describe what the species at risk act and what triggering it uh, com commits the provincial government to downline from from that um, uh, application of, of the uh, status and where the accountability is on, with provincial governments. Uh, so, and ultimately, I'd love to do one of these projects with the First Nations and a conservation group on the ground in Caribou Herd territory. So we're looking for some big funding to run that project. We'll have 100 cameras, people can adopt cameras and get clips from them. And uh, you know, you could be a part of actually doing something on the ground. So now is a time for any questions you might have. Oh my gosh, Lori, oh <laughs> we are all sitting here just infuriated and fascinated by your knowledge. And this is just an astounding presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad you came <laughs> and I'm so glad you presented. I'm so glad we and don't have a windstorm tonight. The power has been out five times this week. We've got one more uh, presentation tonight, but you covered so much so beautifully and if you can just make, um, you know, if you want to put a link in in the chat for people to reach out to you with their questions um, later, I think that would be fantastic. But knowing, I think the biggest question, you know, was after hearing that, it was just so devastating, like, what can we do? And it feels very fruitless, but of course, we're sitting here just angered and wondering what can we do? And so I'm glad you wrapped up with that and that we have this information here. So everybody, please take note of this and uh, let's, let's really try to work together. That's the whole point of this event. And look, Canada's experiencing exactly what the United States is. <laughs> Surprise. It's really, really frustrating. But anyway, thank you for joining us so much. And uh, hopefully we'll, you'll you know, hear from you again soon. Well, it is time for a Cascadia Wolf Party. We all must be feeling really kind of just gut-wrenched from this. <laughs> um.